Hey everybody, I don't know about you, but as you've watched out over the world, the war in uh, Russia and Ukraine is not just isolated to Eastern Europe. It's spread all over the world and you can see it in market instabilities. You can see it here. People who do not think that that war is affecting you, all you got to do is look at gas prices. You look at uh, your food prices. You see the, the global uh, change that has happened. But you know something that's also affected investments as well. And I've said all along, Legacy Precious Metals is your navigator. They're the ones that see you through to get to the next level. The good news about this is even with market volatility, market instability, you've got uh, options. And gold prices are rising as investors turn to gold. And gold presents a hedge against this inflation and that protects you uh, against the weakening dollar, which we are seeing. Legacy Precious Metals is the only company I trust to deal with gold and silver and the other precious metals. You need this investment. You need this as part of your portfolio to keep you buffered from what we're seeing in the world. War and, and, and volatility in the market. This is where you need to be. Uh, call Legacy Precious Metals today. Uh, be proactive about this. Get on board with it. Call them at 866-528-1900. 866-528-1900. Or you can download their free investor's guide at LegacyPMInvestments.com legacypminvestments.com your navigator in a volatile world of investments you want to listen to a podcast by who georgia gop congressman doug collins how, how is it the greatest thing i have ever heard in my whole life i could not believe my ears in this house wherever the rules are disregarded chaos and mob rule it has been said today, where is bravery? I'll tell you where bravery is found and courage is found. It's found in this minority who has lived through the last year of nothing but rules being broken, people being put down, questions not being answered, and this majority say, be damned with anything else. We're going to impeach and do whatever we want to do. Why? Because we won an election. I guarantee you, one day you'll be back in the minority and it ain't going to be that fun. Okay, everybody, we're back uh, on this uh, episode. I want you to know if you're enjoying what you're hearing, if you like uh, listening and, and finding out about elections, we talk about the, the elections coming up, we've talked about immigration, we've had a lot of things, we've had a lot of guests on here recently uh, that, you know, that we've always said it on this podcast that I wanted to have a full rounded podcast that not only deals with politics, but life and everything else uh, that we, we have going on. So I want you to take this podcast. If you're already a subscriber, download it, make sure that you're sharing it. Five, find five to 10 people that you uh, know would like to be interested in, in maybe an episode that you've listened to. Let them uh, have it by sharing that. Also make a comment. If you have uh, wherever you get your uh, podcast downloads, make sure you comment, like it. That helps us out as we spread this reach of conservative message of a whole life message as we go forward. So again, I want to thank you for being a part of the Doug Collins podcast. We're excited, but now it is time for part two of our election overview. Remember last time we got together, we talked about where the election stood in this 2022 election cycle. And we talked about a lot of the reasons why Democrats are getting very, very concerned about this. Uh, to add on to that, before we get into specific elections, and I told you we're going to dig into some of the specifics around the country in these election races, I want to share uh, some also some more information that started to come out, and we're starting to see a bigger uh, concern from Democrats, not just the 2022 cycle. They're concerned about the 2024 cycle, and they're looking ahead because, as I shared in the last episode, one of the things that you have to deal with is the Senate itself is up every uh, a third of it is we're up every uh, two years. So a, a turnover or, or those are in election cycle. What the senators say, they're either in cycle, they're out of cycle, or they're getting ready to go into cycle. So it's an every uh, two year is a third of the Senate is up. Now, on this one, it looks like the, the latest polling are saying that it is a lean Republican uh, election. 2024 is one in which it looks more of a, uh, more also of a bigger lean Republican election based on the uh, Trump voters, based on Biden voters, and based on where we're seeing it right now. So what the concern is among Democrats right now, and we're just laying this out there, is that the fact that if they look at 2022 and they lose the House by a fairly large majority and they lose the Senate by four or five seats, there is a possibility that a Republican, probably or Donald Trump, being reelected in 2024 and having the possibility of having a veto, veto proof Senate. This is how real the, the fear among Democratic consultants are at this point concerning where we are in this election cycle. So, it, this is something that I want us to point out and why we talk about these races, why we're, we're getting uh, dug in. But it's also for conservative out there. If you're listening, do not, uh, and from my perspective, those are the things we want to see, but do not get uh, co complacent. The worst thing that can happen right now is we get complacent 
uh, from a conservative standpoint saying that, oh, you know, Joe Biden is bad. Joe Biden has done this. The Biden administration is terrible. I mean, we start looking at all the, the, the problems of inflation and, and the things that we talked about just the other day that are dragging down Democratic prospects for this cycle. But if we simply depend on people assuming people know this is happening and assuming that, that we're not, uh, you know, that we're just going to win and we miss those bread and butter issues that we talked about, like we have seen that have worked uh, across the country where parents' rights, those issues around schools, the issues around critical race theory, the issues around gender equality, these things that are creeping into our classrooms and where you have uh, the issues that are developing among parents being taken out of the educational loop. These are kind of things that people are, are wanting to find out. They're wanting to find out about inflation. They're wanting to find out, you know, how do we make the economy better without raising the inflation rate, the interest rates that they become to depend on. These are the issues that we're going to have to focus on if conservatives are going to take uh, the 2022 cycle, win the House, win the Senate, and then be in a great shape for what would be coming up in uh, the 2024 cycle, again, which will be a presidential cycle, and we do all this over again, as you would have sensed. So before, I just wanted to lay that back out because this is important, and especially as we talk about some of these states, turnout is going to be key, and this is what we saw happening. I spoke about this the other day on the podcast was that if conservatives don't show up, that we can lose. We saw that in Georgia in uh, January of 2021, uh, where Republicans in, in some of the most conservative districts did not show back up in 8 to 10 to 15 percent uh, margins, which easily cost David Perdue his Senate seat uh, and could have possibly cost uh, Kelly Leffler that the race against Raphael Warnock. So this is where we're at right now. I wanted to give a, an update. We're going to do this again uh, later as time gets a little bit closer. We see some of these primaries get out of the way. And we're going to be talking specifically more primaries today and not the general election. But I'll also give sort of a brief preview of where this is headed. So let's just dig right in. First up, Arizona. Arizona is a pivotal state. Arizona has also been one of the states that has been at the center of of the election integrity fight. This has been one in which uh, there have been numerous problems uh, that have been uh, documented out of Maricopa County uh, in the last election cycle, and it has just caused a stir out there with the Republican Party, with the, with the legislature, and the back and forth that has been going on there. Now, one of the key elements in every, most all of the races we're going to talk about today is the endorsement or lack of endorsement from Donald Trump. These are going to play heavily in these uh, cycles as we go through, and this is something we need to be aware of and, and how they're playing in these different states. The, to make it very clear, Donald Trump is a very large force in the Republican primaries. He is still uh, the most sought-after endorsement. He still moves voters. He has a large contingent. But what we're also seeing is that in some of the races, it is the candidate uh, is playing as much as the endorsement. So let me put it in the perspective of this. If you have a race in which Donald Trump endorses a candidate that is already well-liked, I'll use an example here, Herschel Walker in Georgia, it makes uh, a almost unbeatable, uh, unbeatable team in which you have the President Trump endorsement, you have the popularity of uh, Herschel Walker to start with already with name ID. He's an icon in the state from his football playing career, uh, still getting used to the, the political aspect. But if you combine those two together in a Republican primary, it's, it's almost... Uh, unbeatable. However, we are seeing in some of the different areas that the endorsement helps, but is not the determinant. So if the candidate is not liked or the candidate is not uh, out doing what they need to be doing to make sure that these elections, that they're winning their election, they're raising the money, they're doing the things that uh, candidates do, then it shows that it, it may not be the only determinant of uh, election that the endorsement will help, but it's not the only thing that they need to deal with. So as we dig in here, this is important because Arizona is a place in which we're seeing a lot of movement. Now, this is the Mark Kelly seat. This is the seat that Kelly won in the special election uh, out there in the last cycle. He is uh, the husband of Gabby Giffords, the former congresswoman who was shot. They have raised a ton of money uh, out there in this race. And what we have seen uh, up until now was Mark Kelly playing more with the Biden administration, much more on the uh, very uh, acquiescent to the liberal policies. He went along with, was going along with Build Back Better. He went along with the transportation bill, the, the uh, stimulus package last year on uh, COVID, uh, really sort of playing the team role in that. 
Lately, however, as the polls have been in getting closer, he is, uh, depending on the polls you're looking at right now in Arizona, you're looking at uh, Mark being up, um, you know, in, in an overall uh, perspective, looking probably up around eight, uh, nine points. It's been a while since that has been polled between Republican and Democrat, but he's been up five to six, all of which can evaporate once I believe there is a Republican uh, candidate uh, primary. The primary ends there. Now, uh, Mark Bravovich, who is the attorney general there, uh, received what uh, most would not want to receive in a Republican primary in the state of Arizona. He received, uh, just in the last uh, few days, received a anti-endorsement from Donald Trump. In other words, Donald Trump was not happy with the uh, way that he conducted the after-election uh accounts, how he conducted the uh, the. Uh, recall the in the in the how he handled the ballots how he looked in the investigation and all the things that the problems it saw but then did nothing about it so in essence what donald trump did was say look I, i'm i'm not endorsing this this guy in fact I, i'm encouraging you not uh to be a part of him blake masters uh, some others out there who are running uh in this uh, race it will be an interesting uh, to see how this comes to the layman. Uh, again, it's still a, just a mixed uh, bag uh, right now as we uh, come through Arizona in this Senate race. Why is this Senate race important? This is a Senate, this is a flip seat. This is one in which uh, you use, it's a Democrat seat that is a vulnerable Democrat seat that can be used to flip off of this 50-50 majority of the Democrats given the fact that they have the vice presidency. And that is why that you're gonna see a lot of money uh, poured into Arizona to try from the Democrat perspective to keep Mark Kelly uh, going. Now, on the but the Republicans are, are working very hard to make this not uh, happen. It's gonna be interesting now that with the uh, the latest, you know, polling that came out showing uh, Bromwich in the lead here with uh, over Lamont and Masters, how this uh, negative endorsement from Donald Trump will play. We'll just have to see as that goes. Now, there is also a uh, heavily contested governor's race out there that, from the Republican perspective, uh, that you need to pay attention to as well, because uh, Kerry Lake, who is in the lead now at 29, is an, a Trump endorsed candidate for governor. Uh, Ducey. Uh, Peter, uh, Governor Ducey out there is uh, not uh, running again through uh, term limit uh, expiration there, and chose not to run in the Senate race out there. So this is a this is an open field. Lake is winning that one right now in the early uh, you know, primaries. We go this primary though, however, is not till August second. Let's let's put this in a mindset of of things that are coming up in August second. You're still about four months off. That's an eternity in uh, electoral politics, especially primary politics. So it, it's going to be interesting just to see how that one uh, will come out over the next little bit. Uh, so I wanted to start in Arizona. Arizona is one in which also I think turnout is going to be key. I think it's been heavy uh, in, in that primary. Then we'll see how it turns out in November. But right now, uh, for the Republicans to put two candidates up that can win statewide is important there because that is a flip seat. That is one that the, that... Uh, if you're looking for the national republic, the Senate Republicans to say, how are we going to gain the Senate? Arizona is a, a must flip seat. Now we're going to turn to one that is a little bit uh, in, more interesting, I think, in just the terms of, of dynamics. It's also another August 2nd uh, primary, and it's an open seat in Missouri. This is a seat uh, Roy Blunt is leaving, and it is opened up on the Republican side. And I'm going to focus mainly on the Republican side right now because Missouri will probably not flip Democrat in this one. This one is a hold seat for Republicans, so they've got to hold it. But uh, you know, just as a short reminder, it's not been that long ago uh, that Missouri had Democratic uh, senators in this seat, and we need uh, the you know the Republicans need to be aware of that. So uh, putting the right person in this slot is going to be. Uh, important for the hold that we'll be looking for in this cycle. So let's dive, dive into it. A lot of people here. I've made the mention before in this election that there, there was a lot of people that opted out of this race. And I think that's an important uh, look as you begin to see this uh, field put together. And that was, is you didn't see Jason Smith, a popular uh, congressman uh, from the southeastern corner 
of uh, Missouri opted out. His name had been mentioned many times. In fact, uh, this time last year, it was almost a, a certainty that he was going to get into this race. He chose not to. Ann Wagner, uh, a longtime politician and, and, and former ambassador, member of Congress still uh, from around St. Louis suburbs area, is uh, also opted out of this race. Many people thought that she would run uh, in this and did not. So that then left it open. And when you look at an open seat as someone who has ran in these kind of seats, it leaves it open to anybody who believes that they have a chance. Now, the ones who have jumped into this of the, of the contenders, we'll say, is Vicki Hartzler and Billy Long from the House. They both have safe uh, Republican House seats. They draw from an area in which they have been reelected from uh, many times uh, over. So they're very familiar to their voters in their part of the state. So that brings a certain amount of votes to the table. Uh, the question will be is you know how they then appeal uh, to the uh, Missouri Republicans as a whole. Now, interestingly enough, uh, Donald Trump has not endorsed in Missouri as of this time. He did send out an interesting tweet about a month or so ago saying, have you considered Billy Long? Uh, he said, no, this is not an endorsement, but hey, he's running for Senate. He's a good guy. This is, uh, I think, a, a hat tip to Billy. Billy has been one of the President Trump's strongest supporters. Trump trained. I mean, he was on the uh, the front edge of the 2016 election with Donald Trump and, and has been uh, throughout the Donald Trump's presidency and there in the House. Uh, Billy is a gregarious uh, guy who brings a lot of charisma to the table, but so far it's not really shown up in the uh, polling there. And, you know, he, it'll be interesting to see if he pulls his own district, how that will then play out in the rest. Now, he's also been looking very much for that endorsement. I think by the Twitter uh, post that the president uh, made, he's not going to be getting that endorsement, uh, but the president wanted to be uh, kind to someone who had been very good to him, and that's what we saw. Vicki Harsler. Vicki Harsler, I served with both Billy and Vicki in the United States House. Uh, good people, uh, very quiet. If you would have asked me of the two people from Missouri who would have actually started uh, and actually ran for this Senate seat. These were not two that I would have picked out to start with, but Vicki has caught steam. She is, and uh, some of the polling that we have actually seen, she is uh, leading uh, in these races. And as we look at it, this is going to be a, a fight to August 2nd. The latest uh, polling in the Republican primary has uh, Hartzler uh, with a slight lead, with Schmidt having a slight lead. So it's gone back and forth. And I've gotten into another name, Schmidt, Eric Schmidt and Greitens. Eric Greitens are both in this race. And this is a four-person race if you come down to it. Now, Greitens is a former governor who resigned in a uh, scandal, a, a family issue, an adultery scandal uh, that was uh, very public. He resigned from it. This was dealing with a woman who had accused him of taking pictures and blackmailing uh, her uh, in this affair. Uh, he resigned from his seat uh, as governor has taken time uh, to, I guess, politically rehabilitate himself. And for the much of this uh, primary campaign has actually been leading this race. Uh, this is a, just in a fairness knot here. This is one that Repu national Republicans are scared for. They believe that, it, that and it's been reported that some, not all, but some national Republicans believe that if Greitens is the nominee, that this could be a seat that could be in play in uh, November with the Democrat. Uh, and then as he was leading, uh, more came out from his ex-wife accusing of abuse, uh, physical abuse of, of his family, her, the kids. Um, this seems to have taken some steam out of the Greitens campaign as far as the numbers goes. And we're seeing a movement now of him moving down. So what does that leave? That leaves uh, Vicki Harsler, who received the endorsement of Josh Hawley, who is the other senator, uh, very much of a uh, established uh, uh, figure in political life in Missouri. Uh, who shares a campaign team, by the way, with Vicki Hartzler, has come out and endorsed uh, Vicki in this race. Uh, that has made uh, Vicki's stock jump. Hartzler's numbers have come up, and, and we're seeing that in uh, the polling that has taken place. She's running around uh, 24 25%, um, and Greitens is still there, although he has come down in recent uh, weeks uh, from that number. And then Schmidt, who is Eric Schmidt, who is the actual attorney general, 
of Missouri, who's been running again for over a year in this race, uh, have spoken to him many times on radio and in person. Uh, he's running a strong campaign. This is someone who's ran uh, statewide, had won statewide. He has built a presence of suing the Biden administration. Uh, he's run uh, on that strong uh, conservative background. And he is now uh, competing with Hartzler for the, the bid here in uh, the state of Missouri. So uh, how this turns out, it'll be interesting. I think if you look at it, Greitens is the concern of most of the uh, establishment Republicans, if you want to put it that way. Uh, and seeing that they can hold this seat uh, with Schmidt, with uh, also with uh, Hartzler, uh, you don't see as much of a concern on the national Republican race if they're either one of those or the nominee. Uh, there, uh, those are the top four. McCloskey is in this. This is Mark McCloskey. He came in uh, to the national prominence when him and his wife uh, were fended off the uh, BLM protesters outside his house with his uh, firearms. Uh, this uh, caused a stir, of course, nationwide, uh, and now he is using uh, that platform to run for Senate. At this point, not making a big difference. Most of his numbers are in the, the low uh, teen, the single digits, 2 to 5% in that regard. So, But again, just enough to make it uh, interesting. Billy Long's uh, about double digits. The rest are running neck and neck between 20 and 25%. Again, I mentioned Missouri simply because this is a state that Donald Trump is not endorsed in. He's he's talked about it. He, I think he's indicated he probably will. But this is another August 2nd primary. Not sure where we're going to see that one, uh, if there will be an endorsement in that one until uh, we see uh, that go on. Then we turn to one in which Donald Trump has endorsed in. And this is uh, going to be uh, an interesting race. It is one that is coming up very soon. And it is one that has been filled with a little bit of controversy. It's been filled with controversy simply because Donald Trump has inserted himself into it. Uh, last fall, uh, at a rally in North Carolina, uh, Donald Trump endorsed Ted Budd for the United States Senate seat. This is an open seat uh, that is moving forward uh, there. Uh, and it was seemingly, and most reports was, is from the uh, encouragement of former a congressman from North Carolina, former chief of staff to Donald Trump, uh, Mark Meadows, who uh, facilitated that, helped that endorsement to come along. Interestingly enough, at the time, uh, Ted Budd was uh, sort of lagging in the polls, not raising a lot of money. He was down uh, underneath uh, Pat McCroy. Mark Walker was, uh, was, and at this time, was again, in the Senate race. Uh, a lot of things going on uh, dynamic-wise. Then you get the Donald Trump factor after the fact. This is where, uh, again, as we're seeing, that this is going to be a May 17th primary. So that we're going to get some of the early test of not only Republican turnout, but also of the endorsement matched with a candidate in North Carolina with Ted Budd and the endorsement of Donald Trump. Uh, as we look at this, Mark Walker, as all stories go and it's come out, and I think most have agreed that at this point, this the scenario to be true was encouraged to get out of this race to run back for a congressional seat uh, that he would have had the endorsement of Donald Trump in. He uh, chose not to. The reason this is important, if you're looking, Pat McCroy, former governor of the state, is running second. He has a uh, is, was in a lead for a long time, and the need there is to get over 30% to avoid a runoff. So Ted Budd is running over 30% right now. This is uh, going to be a race that's going to come down to uh, turnout and how many people come uh, out to vote. And uh, again, take into account uh, Ted's endorsement by Donald Trump. And then also, how much votes does Mark Walker pull from, from Ted Budd? Right now, we're not seeing, uh, frankly, uh, Mark Walker pulling votes from uh, Pat McCroy. He's, if anything, he's pulling votes from Ted Budd. And so we'll see how this goes. Budd is not debating in uh, North Carolina. Uh, we're seeing that as a trend. We'll talk about it a little bit further when we get to the state of Georgia. But uh, Mark Walker's campaign is making a, a big deal about that. Bud's campaign is not. And since the last campaign rally a few weeks ago in North Carolina, uh, with uh, Donald Trump, we have seen Ted Budd's numbers go up. It is looking more and more like he is uh, going to win uh, the Republican primary there without a uh, runoff uh, as it looks it stands right now. Again, uh, April, I mean, May 17th will tell us a lot in that one. Now, on the Democratic side, it's a runaway. Uh, the Democratic side is uh, uh, Sherry Beasley. Beasley is up you know, 33 points on the field here, and you know most of the other candidates do not have name recognition, name ID, or anywhere else to get here. North Carolina has also been very uh, hectic as far as uh, states go 
uh, recently and because of their redistricting. They've went through several cycles of redistricting over the last four or five uh, years, uh, and it is, it is becoming more and more of a problem when you have a Democrat governor uh, with Republican legislatures, and this is what we're seeing with, with maps. In some of the most gerrymandered districts that we've, we've seen uh, in the, over the past number of years out of North Carolina, uh, they've now, uh, I think, set on the map that they're going to use for this cycle, but they could change again. So it's, it's thrown a lot of these districts uh, up into play. Some of these uh, uh, congressional races are going to get uh, interesting. Uh, Madison Cawthorn uh, was decided early on that he was going to run in a district uh, next to his district, the district he currently represents. After the maps came back out, he went back to his old district, which has uh, caused a little bit of a stir in the western North Carolina mountains in that part on uh, what is he actually uh, you know, running for, where is his attention is going to be. So again, North Carolina is a very active state. North Carolina is one that we need to watch as we move forward. And it's going to be one of the first bellwethers, if you would, of where uh, the strength of the Trump endorsement along with the strength of the candidates are going to matter. And Ted Budd, uh, after a slow start, has picked it up. He is leading uh, and looks to be, by all accounts in the next four weeks, will take probably the... Uh, primary there on the Republican side will face Beasley going into the fall. And again, this is another one in which is a hold for Republicans, but it is a difficult hold. Uh, North Carolina is a, a, a purple state. It is one that uh, is elected, of course, a Democratic governor just in the last cycle. These are things that you need to watch in North Carolina. So again, if you're keeping score, you're having to keep the 50-50 the threshold here. Um, Arizona is a flip. Uh, Missouri is a hold. North Carolina is a hold. So for Republicans, that means that they need to keep both uh, uh, Missouri and North Carolina to, to maintain where we are. We're not picking up any ground in these states, but you can lose ground. So a loss in North Carolina would make it difficult uh, to obtain that majority that they're, that they're looking for. All right, as you can see, we're plowing through these, and I wanted to, you know, if you can listen to us, uh, you know, replay this, save it, share it with your friends, because I'm giving you as, as best as I can an in depth look into how these races are playing out. Uh, and we're going to continue on because it, with these races, we'll determine the uh, Senate in particular. Uh, some of the governor's races we'll talk about as we go along, uh, as we uh, look at this, but these Senate races will determine the Senate uh, makeup come. Uh, next January. And that will be important. Remember, as I started this podcast off on, is that Democrats are not only concerned about losing majorities in this cycle, but they're also concerned about losing majority and, and even further in the 2024 cycle when you probably, it looks at this point, having Donald Trump back on the ticket, having a weakened Joe Biden ticket, if Joe Biden runs at all. And, you know, they're the fear among uh, some Democrats is that the, the hole gets worse in 2024 to where you could actually you know, run close to having a veto-proof uh, majority in the United States Senate. That would be something, uh, and a, or a cloture closure that would be really uh, de be devastating for Democrats, but be very uh, helpful for Republicans, especially with a Republican in the White House. All right, uh, moving on, on only going to touch on this one very uh Briefly, because it is a purple state, it is also another one of those states that had a lot of issues in the election and election integrity issues and, and problems coming out of it. There have been lawsuits. There have been in the legislature. There's just been a, a lot of things going on. This is a GOP hold seat. It, it appears that will stay a hold seat uh, at this point in time. Uh, Ron Johnson is running for his third term. Ron Johnson is always seemingly uh, one of those... Uh, Tough races, and no matter when he has run, he, he ran six years ago. Uh, people were not sure he was going to win. He did win six years ago. Now he's back again running. Uh, the Democrats, uh, this is a Democrat a governor state, is a lieutenant governor state. There's a lot of elections up and down, Wisconsin being one of those uh, really true purple areas statewide. Uh, so you can't just write it off as easily that Ron Johnson will uh, automatically just be reelected here. But again, when you're talking about holes and gains, this is a hold seat. So Ron Johnson needs to win. It looks like Mandela Barnes right now is, is in the lead. Uh, this was from a poll a little uh, month or so back uh, in the Democratic primary. We'll see how that turns out. But again, another late breaking primary uh, that you need to be aware of. These are in August 9th. This is back, uh, as we talked about some of the others, August 9th. So we'll see. By then, there's going to be some issues that I think will affect it that I'm going to talk about here at the end of the, the podcast that we'll preview uh, for you. All right, that brings us then to uh, Alabama. 
Alabama is uh, on the radar because it has been one of the, as we talked about, um, this is one that uh, Donald Trump played early in and then has withdrew his uh, endorsement. Mo Brooks, uh, strong supporter of Donald Trump uh, throughout the time, uh, not did did not do well fundraising, did not do well in polls. In fact, was beginning to fall backwards. Uh, last fall, he made uh, what Donald Trump determined was a, a fatal mistake in saying that there was no need to look back at the 2020 elections, that we had to move forward. Um, and about a month ago, Donald Trump removed the endorsement of Mo Brooks in Alabama for the United States Senate. Now we'll see. He was third in the race when this happened. Nobody expects him to pick up uh, momentum after losing this nomination, but I mean, you can already sense the bitterness in Mo Brooks uh, since then. But then that brings this race down to uh, two people, Katie uh, Britt and uh, Walcott, who is a uh, person that most people might walk out know is from Black Hawk Down. He's an Army helicopter pilot, war hero, uh, someone that is uh, making a, uh, a name in Alabama, slowly but surely, but in the polling and uh, the numbers, he is uh, coming up and him and Britt are vying for the lead here. Now, Katie Britt is a uh, uh, young person coming into politics, but yet the right seat that she is running for uh, is uh, Richard Shelby's seat. Shelby is retiring. So again, this is a, a hold and it will stay a hold uh, with either one of these candidates winning this uh, primary. Uh, and he has made every uh, intention and also from a very tangible standpoint, put a lot of money behind Britt's campaign. Uh, in this race, again, the Alabama Senate race is coming up very soon. You're going to see, I believe, Donald Trump play in this again. I think not from just the simple fact that he withdrew the nomination from uh, Mo Brooks, but you're going to see him come back in probably a week, 10 days out. This will be my thought in this race and endorse one of the other, Walcott or Britt, and we'll see uh, where uh, that leads. I would assume that it would uh, depend a lot on poll numbers and where people uh, have settled out in this race. So then this is again coming up very soon. Uh, not necessarily one that is determinant, but it will be interesting to see where the president uh, Trump lands if he goes back in. He said he would endorse in Alabama. We'll see where, where that is going to go. If you had uh, an advantage going here, Britt probably has the advantage going into the primary and coming out uh, of this as the nominee. But Walcott has made a strong showing. And with Walcott's strong showing, has pushed Brooks basically out of this. That and coupled with the fact that Donald Trump withdrew his endorsement, uh, money and votes will probably be flowing out away from Mo Brooks, and we'll see how that race goes. So that is uh, one that, uh, again, to watch, it's going to stay Republican, but I, I wanted to put it on your radar because it is one of the more fascinating races when you deal with the element of Donald Trump's uh, endorsement or unendorsement. Now we're going to get into two states that are as heavily in play as any states that you're going to see in this cycle. And the determination of Senate uh, and uh, even some of the governor's races will play out of these two states. The first one that we're going to look at is one that is, uh, it is May 17th, uh, is the primary, and it is contested. It is hot. This is the one in which uh, the president just endorsed, and, and he endorsed Mehmet Oz, Dr. Oz of the TV fame, uh, over David McCormick, uh, who is uh, another conservative in the uh, conservative in the race, who has a lot of support in uh, the Trump world or Trump backing, and of course you have Carla Sands, who was an ambassador under Donald Trump, running this, and she's at this point you know running a, a rather lackluster third uh, in this race. The question uh, coming up here is, is what does the Trump endorsement do for Dr. Oz and McCormick? These are two head to head. Now, Dr. Oz was way ahead in this race. Uh, name ID. Uh, I think I've talked to a lot of Pennsylvania voters who at this point in time say, you know, because Dr. Oz, one of the things that people were upset about was that he was uh, living in New Jersey, not from Pennsylvania. Uh, from everything we can gather, I can gather on the ground, the carpetbagger kind of mentality or coming into a race is not applying. Uh, they all have shown McCormick's, you know, not live there in a while, Sands. I mean, it's just, it sort of played out. What did start playing out is McCormick is backed by some of the largest amounts of outside money uh, in the country coming from super PACs. And they began to attack uh, Dr. Oz a few weeks ago. 
and the numbers reflected it. Uh, for those of you out there who do not believe that negative ads work, uh, you're sadly mistaken. All you got to do is look at Pennsylvania race and you'll find out that this is what actually happens uh, when you start a very focused, very uh, large campaign to uh, point out the negatives of another candidate. And McCormick's campaign has been hitting odds and hitting odds and hitting odds. Oz has started to hit back, but it took a double-digit lead down to uh, basically even. So this race is going to come out on, on the 17th of uh, May. It's an open seat, the old Pat Toomey seat. Uh, it's going to be interesting to see which one is going to sneak up ahead here. And remember, this is a, a winner take all. So, I mean, you could literally win the Senate nomination for Republicans with 20, 21, 22 percent. Um, and so it's going to be interesting to see how this all plays out. Uh, inside advantage, I think the Oz endorsement uh, from Trump is going to help. Uh, but when you've seen the backlash online, you've seen the backlash from uh, conservative activists who were very upset at, at Donald Trump for endorsing Dr. Oz and this for his past comments, his past statements on a variety of issues from uh, you know transgender to uh, the president and former president himself and others. Uh, and in an unusual statement, when he did endorse Dr. Oz, he made us uh, he really clarified the fact that he had not had said had not said things good about him in the past, but that he had learned that he had seen the way. So, in other words, uh, Donald Trump believing that uh, Dr. Oz is going to be the kind of Republican he would want to endorse. Uh, a lot of people, though, who are working for uh, McCormick, who are, have ties heavily ties to the Trump administration, were disappointed that he would weigh in on this race and endorse Dr. Oz. So it, again, I, I can't say enough uh, about how this one is going to be an early test of that Trump endorsement. You have two very well-funded candidates. You have Trumps who have uh, candidates who both have their own strong base. They're both campaigning hard. They're both on TV. Um, and so what is, what's the, the determinant? You know, could be this uh, Trump endorsement. So I think if you, you look at this right now, the Oz endorsement from Trump is going to uh, give him a, a slight advantage. We'll see how these last few weeks play out in Pennsylvania. Now, I don't want to leave Pennsylvania, though, without touching on the Democrat race, which has been very interesting. One of the issues that we talked about having uh, with the Democrats is, is their, uh, their policy issues of the, of the far left. And basically, it's very progressiveness. It's not matching up with uh, a lot of, of the country. And in that, you've got Fetterman and Lamb, uh, John Fetterman and Connor Lamb, uh, for the most part, who are running uh, in this primary. Fetterman is way out in front right now. And Fetterman is, if you go to most... Uh, I've talked to some Democratic uh, consultants. They would tell you that Fetterman is going to be the harder one to try and keep this seat uh, in some ways, although Pittsburgh, Pittsburgh and, and Philadelphia and other parts of the state will go heavily for the uh, current uh, lieutenant governor. Uh, it is a race that is going to uh, stretch the Democratic Party faithful. We'll see how the, the, the Pennsylvania is not a New York. It's not a California. It's not an Illinois. They're, they're going to have to uh, see how a Fetterman would play. Although he is one statewide, he's now going to have to play on a different stage. Connor Lamb uh, came out of the Pittsburgh area, very well funded. He won the House seat. He has been one of the consistent, more moderate uh, blue dog Democrats, if you would, uh, which seemed to have would have played in uh, the, the state of Pennsylvania very well. But so far, it, it is just not. Fetterman's money advantage, uh, his notoriety, uh, and others have just played. And he is well on a double-digit lead right now in this Democratic primary. I do not see Lamb overcoming that. And it sets up an interesting uh, race, whether it be uh, Fetterman and McCormick or Fetterman and Oz. That one is going to be a one to race. Uh, also, uh, the governor's race up there is getting tight. Um, as we uh, look at these. So, you, and, and when you look at the governor's race in Pennsylvania, again, same kind of, of uh, uh, dynamics working there. This is a, uh, an interesting part. Mastriano, who is, uh, Doug Mastriano has come from basically out of nowhere to uh, lead um, in some polls in this race against Lou Barletta. Lou was a former congressman, a friend of mine when I served in Congress. Mastriano was very instrumental in the election issue and integrity issues in Pennsylvania and uh, has used that to his advantage in this Republican primary. Lou Barletta uh, campaign seems to be sluggish, not moving as well. 
the president has not endorsed in this race, and most people feel he will not probably endorse in this race. Although he is close with Lou Barletta, who is very close with him early on in his presidency. Mastriano was with him in the election integrity issues and his side of the, the story in Pennsylvania and pushing uh, to uh, make sure every vote counted and every vote was legal. So I think you'll see Donald Trump stay out of this one. This sets up an interesting, like I said, development on May 17th. You're going to get some answers uh, nationally uh, on May 17th on several of these races as we go forward. That brings us to the last one, and the last one is Georgia. I know a lot about this one because it is, of course, something that I have done. I've run statewide here in the Senate. I've been in the Congress uh, for a number of years. Uh, this race in Georgia, the Senate race is, is frankly, uh, unless something drastically changed, all but over. Walker will win. Uh, it looks to be in the position to win the uh, Senate uh, Republican primary. Gary Black, a, a great candidate, a good friend of mine who I have supported, in this race uh, is just not been able to get the traction. He's uh, he's tried his best. He's done what he can at this point. The numbers are just not moving. Uh, and there's several others uh, in this uh, Senate seat uh, primary that all have been a very you know sort of attract. They've been not sort of their attractive candidates, uh, but have not been able to overcome uh, the popularity of Herschel Walker in this state, the former you know Heisman Trophy winner, the former running back from Georgia, uh, but Latham Sadler, Kelvin King, uh, others, Josh Clark have just not been able to to cut into it. The interesting point here, though, and I think that has many Republicans worried about this race. Is this is a race against Raphael Warnock? Raphael Warnock is an incumbent. He won the special that I was a part of uh, two years ago, and has amassed a massive war chest, and is just simply waiting at this point to see if it is Herschel Walker. I think most Democratic officers will tell you they want it to be Herschel Walker. Herschel Walker, uh, like uh, Greitens in Missouri and others, have uh, issues in their past of domestic violence and other things that he has attempted to address. Uh, but when you put a lot of money behind these things, uh, you will just have to see how the public will respond to it. So his popularity, head-to-head uh, -head with Warnock, uh, right now he's winning, but the Democrats have not started attacking Walker. Most of his opponents have not had the resources to do so in a large way, but you'll see that happen. So uh, it's shaping up May 24th, another big day here. Uh, this is, uh, Walker is, of course, endorsed by Donald Trump. That is, you, again, as I said earlier in this podcast, you tie a, a popular candidate with the endorsement of Donald Trump, very hard to beat in a Republican uh, primary. Uh, Warnock does not have anybody to really to face, so this is setting up to be a Warnock-Walker uh, November. Uh, Walker has chosen not to debate. He's chosen not to appear uh, on stage with any of the Republicans. He shows his interviews very carefully. Um, and so I think that's caused some concern among Republicans in Georgia, uh, myself included, but others, that they just needs to be out in practice because this is a seat that if you want to take back the House, uh, the Senate, I'm sorry, from a Republican perspective, you've got to have Georgia. Georgia is one of those flip seats. And if we don't flip Georgia um, and these other races that we've been talking about, it makes it harder to find where you're going to gain uh, the votes to, or gain the election wins to flip uh, the Senate back to the Republicans. Now, the other race in Georgia, there's several races. Uh, Donald Trump has endorsed heavily in the state of Georgia, endorsed seven candidates um, in the state. One is David Perdue, who's running against Brian Kemp. Brian Kemp's the incumbent governor. Uh, at this time of the race, you would never expect an incumbent governor in a state like Georgia, which is doing well financially and other reasons, to be under the 50% threshold for a runoff. And so far, consistently, Brian Kemp has been under that number uh, with David Perdue. He is leading uh, Perdue at this point double digits. Uh, Trump's endorsed David Perdue. Uh, the race, uh, Perdue has not had the financial uh, resources that Kemp has had. Kemp has been on the, the TV. He's been able to use his position as incumbent governor in the state legislature in the legislative session uh, to maintain that. But this race will get uh, very interesting if that on May 24th, it turns into a runoff between David Perdue and Brian Kemp in which all eyes of the world will be on this. Uh, Donald Trump, this is one of the races in which he has done something unusual. He has actually laid in a half a million dollar buy uh, into or gift into the uh, Super PAC supporting David Purdue. So we'll start seeing that money flow out. You'll start seeing uh, how this race will affect. This one is a, a race to the runoff. If Brian Kemp can avoid the runoff, of course, then he goes into the fall to face Stacey Abrams. If he gets into a runoff, then his uh, it's going to be a lot harder, I believe, for him to keep uh, the nomination and would put Purdue in the race with Abrams in the fall. Why is this important? Because in Georgia, the polarization in these races from Kemp to Raffensperger to Carr, these are the Secretary of State, the Attorney General, 
and others uh, is is the anonymity toward, from the Republican base is 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 actual. Uh, Brian Kemp, the governor of Georgia, went to Fulton County, which is in the city of Atlanta uh, area, to a Republican Party meeting just over a week ago and uh, was basically run off the stage. He refused. Uh, he got very hostile questions and very hot. He gave back very choppy, very hostile answers and left after two questions. It was something that did, did not look good. And we've seen across the state, he has not been very well received in, in many, not all, but many of the Republican parties around the state. And he's chosen also at this point to sort of avoid the debate stage in a Republican primary. So uh, the question will be is will Republicans who are very upset and, and Donald Trump who is beat uh, in the message clearly that Brian Kemp is not the choice that he wants, that, Raff, that Raffensperger and Kemp and Carr need to be defeated. Um, and this primary, the question is what will happen after the primary on whoever wins going into the fall. And if, if Kemp happens to pull this off, how will that then motivate the Republican base to then get out and vote in November? This is going to be one of the keys. This is why Georgia, in my mind, on May 24th, ranks as one of the highest, not only tests for the Trump endorsement, but also the test where will the uh, Republicans be able to flip the Senate uh, come November. Right now, every indication it is, Walker in the Senate side, Walker would be leading a head-to-head, -head, Black's leading a head-to-head. -head. Um, but again, the Democrats have not started spending money. Abrams has not really started spending money at all either in the, in the governor's race, waiting to see who the primary opponent of the Republican nominee will be. So we'll see how this all works out. So there you are. In a short amount of time, a, a trip around the major inflection points, and there'll always be some surprises, but I wanted to lay out these two podcasts side of side by side. You share them, uh, like them, use them uh, to give you a primer on what's coming up over the next few months in the Republican primaries, some of the Democratic primaries, the major races that will, that will determine that you're going to be hearing nonstop come October and November. We want to give you these behind the scenes. It's not the last time we'll do this. We'll be a part of this uh, going forward. So thanks for listening. Share this. Make sure that you're caught up. And if you're in one of these states in which you've got a primary coming up, May 17th, May 24th, some of these coming up, get out and vote. A conservative, take your voice, make it heard at the ballot box. That's the way we win races is we get out with our ideas, find you a candidate, support them, and get out there and vote. God bless you. We'll see you the next time on the Doug Collins Podcast. In November of 2020, the Democrats were up to no good. You know, they were trying to win election, but they were doing it the wrong way. They were planning to pull off the greatest scheme in election fraud that had never been seen before. They didn't think anyone would catch them. <laughs> but guess what? They got caught. Find out what they did and how they did it in the new documentary film called 2000 Mules, directed and narrated by renowned filmmaker Dinesh D'Souza and executive produced by Salem Media Group with research from truthevote.org. 2,000 Mules tells the story of the ones who tried to hijack a presidential election. You'll see the actual video surveillance tapes. You'll see how we tracked their cell phones to box after box as they got paid to carry out this illegal scheme. Watch the movie and decide for yourself. Attend a limited release premiere of 2,000 Mules on May 2nd or May 4th. Now remember, these are the only two times it's going to be in uh, the movie theater. So if you want to watch it with like-minded folks, these are the two dates that you need, May 2nd and May 4th. In fact, you're going to even get to see it before the exclusive premiere at Mar-a-Lago uh, later this uh, month. So I want you to be uh, ready for that. But May 2nd and May 4th, check out your local listings and get your tickets today at 2000mules.com. And that's the number, 2000mules.com. You will not want to miss this. This is some groundbreaking stuff by one of the uh, Salem faculty members, Dinesh D'Souza and the Salem Media Group, 2000mules.com. If you want to see that in the movie theaters, it's May 2nd and May 4th. Go and get your tickets at 2000mules.com. Hey everybody, it's Doug Collins. I can't wait to tell you about a new partner here on the Doug Collins Podcast, Healthy Cell. HealthyCell.com, you can go to, to their website. They are reimagining the way that we take vitamins. I mean, look, you don't still listen, you know, for the most part, record players are for the vintage side. You look at for, for old time, you don't listen for the crispest, clear. There's things out there that you get right now that have updated in the future. And we're still taking vitamins like we did back in the 1930s. This new technology, this new product from Healthy Cell is a micro gel that takes your vitamins, puts them in a gel form. You can take it straight out of the pack. You can mix it in water or, or your favorite food, but it gets into your system so much quicker. 165% better absorption through this micro gel technology. And believe me, the more you get in the nutrients into your body, the better you're going to be. They have a full product line. I take these medicine, these, this, uh, pack, these meta gel packets. They are amazing. Uh, we have been on them now for a little over a month and I can tell the biggest difference. I've taken vitamins most of my adult life 
And the way these work is just something that I don't think that you can find anywhere else. Again, it's healthycell.com. You can go forward slash Collins or use Collins in the promo code uh, to get a 20% discount. You don't want to miss this. Please go check out their website, healthycell.com, microgel for these vitamins that are the best thing out there right now to keep you healthy and listening to the Doug Collins podcast. Hey everybody, I just want to talk about sleep. You know why I want to talk about sleep? It's because I just got out from underneath my my pillow bed sheets and my pillow that I keep under my head every night because I like to sleep on my side, I like to sleep on my back, I like to sleep, you know, I move at night and my pillow is just the best thing that goes under my head. It keeps me uh, getting restful sleep, the sheets are amazing, it's just what you need. Everybody understands you need seven hours of sleep. Why not sleep in some of the best products out there? And Mike and the folks at my pillow are great folks to do this with then you can go to MyPillow.com or you can call them at 800-564-8475. You'd code word Collins, C-O-L-L-I-N-S. You won't want to miss this. If you have not got the, the these Giza uh, bed sheets, you need them. They're amazing. They're soft. They don't wear out. You need those to that get that sleep against your body at night and provide that cooling, uh, just soothing nature that lets you get the most sleep. But you know, they're not just about bed uh, sheets and pillows. They also have the My Slippers. Uh, amazing. I don't wear, uh, I've talked to you about it before. I don't wear slippers, but I do wear My Slippers. They're amazingly comfortable. You can wear them outside. You can wear them inside. Great products. You've got uh, towels. You've got all kinds of stuff. Go to MyPillow.com. It's spring cleaning time. It's spring time to get out there and try and buy new things. Replace some of your old stuff. You'll want to replace your towels. Get some other uh, products for your bedroom all at MyPillow.com, MyPillow.com, or call 800-564-8475. Use the promo code Collins, C-O-L-L-I-N-S. When you check out, I guarantee you will be satisfied.